face. Yeah. All right. Looks like we are live. Hi, and welcome to our, I think, fourth episode of Parent Connect. Um, we are live with two of the moms from St. Paul who are both involved in St. Zelly Ministry, which is a ministry for moms with younger children. So we're going to talk about young kids this week. Um, yeah, so if we could start off, ladies, if you could just tell us a little bit about your kids. So we'll start with you, Erica. Sure. So I, um, I'm Erica Rodkey. I have three young girls. My oldest, Grace, just turned four a couple weeks ago. And then I have a two and a half year old, Claire. And Kate is almost seven months, six, six and a half months. Um, and they are all home with me right now. All right. And what about you, Kathleen? I have two girls, Carrie, who's five, and Brenna is three. And I get the nut home with me, stay at home moms. That's so great. All right. So, um, how did both of you find St. Paul? Um, I can start. Uh, so, <laughs> I, oh, sorry. Um, my husband, Kevin, actually grew up at Resurrection. Um, that's his home parish. And when we got engaged um, and we're looking for some place to get married, we, um, he didn't really want to get married at Resurrection. <laughs> um, St. Paul's is prettier. And he just mentioned that a lot of Resurrection parishioners end up going over to St. Paul's. And when we bought our house, that was actually closer for us. Um, St. Paul's was closer than Resurrection. So we started attending there and that's where we ended up um, getting married and have just stayed parishioners there ever since. Um, so we're kind of equidistance between the two parishes, but St. Paul's just kind of took over our hearts. That's awesome. Um, all right. So then Kathleen. So we found St. Paul's after we moved to Ellicott City and we were kind of going from all the different parishes. Um, my husband grew up in Columbia and he went to St. John's in Columbia, the Wild Lake Interfaith Center. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was his main parish, and we were both looking for a little bit more um, traditional. And St. Paul's has you know, the old church feel and traditional. So that's where we landed once we moved to Ellicott City. All right, so real quick before we kind of get into the meat and potatoes of like talking about, especially with little kids, faith and getting comfortable going to mass, because um, I know that's kind of a concern for a lot of younger parents. Um, just to talk about some of the programs that are offered at both Resurrection and St. Paul for children of this age group. So, um, I know Kathleen, you help out with JAM, which is Jesus and Me. If you could just speak a little bit about that. Jesus is, Jesus and Me is for ages four to about six. Um, and we meet, uh, weekly during the 930 mass. Um, so the kids come right to us, um, right even before mass starts. And we do usually, um, we start with prayer. We do a story and a craft is typically the setup. Great. Um, and so at Resurrection, we have a similar program, um, but it's called We Praise. And it is during our 1030 Mass, um, which right now, obviously, we're not having. But if any watchers don't know, we are posting various things for uh, preschool students or to keep your younger kids engaged, particularly during Mass, because that can be a little bit challenging. Um, and maybe you can speak to, so we're just going to kind of jump back and forth between topics, but Erica, particularly like how you engaged your kids in the Stations of the Cross, I felt like was really cool. So if you could talk a little bit about that. So um, we have been taking the girls to Stations during Lent since Grace was an infant. Um, that was something that Kevin had grown up doing every Friday during Lent, they were at stations. And it's something that we adopted as a couple um, after we started dating and especially after we got married. Um, and we really up until last year, um, were able to, to keep with it every week. Um, obviously this year things changed with the um, quarantine, but we have been talking about it so much in, in preparation for Lent that Grace especially really wanted to do stations and we knew our options were limited. Um, we also knew that we had a very short window of attention span. Um, mm -hmm. So we, I was able to get online and find um, like color printouts for the stations. And we actually let her during 
uh, mass on Holy Thursday, she colored all of the stations, which was really just kind of scribbling over them. Um, but then we hung them through the living room and walked through the children's stations. Um, you guys, that you guys had put out um, yeah. earlier that week. Um, and it was maybe 10 minutes and we put them all down at eye level for the, for the girls and walked through them very, very quickly. But it just was an opportunity for us at home to be able to um, still pray the stations as a family on Good Friday, um, like we would have done throughout Lent any other year. So great. Um, that's awesome. So, and you ladies can correct me if I'm wrong, but so I know Resurrection has nursery and then we praise, um, obviously vacation Bible school during the summer, we do pre-K four and pre-K if a kid's still five. Um, and I think it's the same at St. Paul, right? They do pre-K for BBS as well, or, okay. I think, I think so. I think, I think Carrie could have done it last year at four. Um, she was four. Yeah. So I think they started pre-K too. Great. I think. Um, all right. So then having just become a young mom, <laughs> like learning how important it is for community, you know, that's something that as soon as like, I was kind of walking again, I was like finding all of the parent groups on Facebook and like, uh, Howard County General has like a first time moms group, um, but particularly like moms in the faith. So I have one friend at Resurrection who also just had a baby and we're like, as soon as we can, we're going to go walking again together. But um, obviously St. Paul has this ministry that is developed that um, you're both kind of a part of. So if maybe we could start just talk, how did you get involved in St. Zelly ministry? Um, if you want to start Kathleen. Well, I think it's just, it's sort of the same kind of approach you're taking. Um, I would say for you to take a step back from trying to find and join all of those mom's groups on Facebook, because for me, I found them all very overwhelming and they were all in a lot of ways um, judgmental in the sense of if you're not nursing or, or if you're bottle feeding, eating, this and that, you know, whereas... I was really searching for people to have more of a common ground with. And um, when I first had Carrie, there was a mom's group that seemed to be connected with St. Paul's and Resurrection. And I had, Carrie was only a couple months old and it was um, some other ladies running it. And then it just seemed to disappear. But <laughs> um, I went to their very last session because Carrie was born in March and they did one in May. And then it just seemed to fizzle out um, because I think what happened was the kids who were in it were a little bit older. Mm -hmm. So they were aging into kindergarten or whatever. Um, but, um, and then I had spoken to Deacon George saying, you know, how come there isn't a mom's group? And he was like, Oh, that's a good question. And then somehow a year or two later, Erica asked the same question. <laughs> he goes, I know the person you need to talk to. <laughs> so Deacon George brought us together. <laughs> that's awesome. So then Erica, that is kind of, do you have anything to add? So for me, I, I, um, I'm not a local to this area. I grew up in Ohio and came out here for college and all of my college friends had left um, the area after school. And so I've been kind of on this island in Columbia with young kids trying to figure out where my place was. Um, I had also was in school full time um, trying to finish a dissertation when I had the first two. And so when I finally graduated in um, May of 2018, and I could like take a deep breath and was like, I have two kids, two and under, what the heck am I doing? Like I need support and community. Um, it had, I, like Kathleen was just searching for that. And I reached out to Deacon George after sometime in early June and just said, you know, what's, what's the thought? And he's like, let me connect you to Kathleen. And it kind of just <laughs> developed from there. We've um, yeah. tried really hard to meet twice a month um, for about an hour in the nursery, just to let the kids play and for us to get a chance to talk to another adult. Um, sometimes that's faith-based and sometimes that's just, oh my gosh, my children are driving me nuts. Can you relate to this? Um, but we usually try to make sure there's some sort of faith component there. And, you know, how are you supporting your faith life? How, you know, how are you doing with the kids? Um, and then we've also tried really hard to 
meet once a month outside of the nursery in the evenings to accommodate moms who are working full time. So for us, it was, we were easily able to meet during the day because we both were stay at home moms. Um, but we had a lot of interest from parents that were not stay at home moms and were still looking to connect. Um, so usually one night a month, we try to do like a mom's night out and go somewhere in old Ellicott city for dinner and drinks and just connect um, as moms without our kids too, which is nice because we always have our kids with us in the nursery. Amen. <laughs> uh, that's so, and there's so many great spots in old Ellicott city for that, you know, I'm really excited to mm -hmm. get to see the new Phoenix Co, you know, when this finally ends. <laughs> Cause like we went on so many dates there. Uh, so it like holds a really special place in our hearts, but um, no, that's so great. So I do know the, but um, I do know the answer, but can either of you kind of explain why it's called St. Zelly if anyone doesn't know who St. Zelly is? Sure, so St. Zelly is the mother of St. Therese of Lisieux, and she and her husband, St. Louis, were the first couple canonized together as a couple, um, I think five years ago this summer, I think it was July of 2015. Um, and they were just a really strong example of um, Catholic parents raising Catholic kids. They lost, I think, four of their nine children, um, either in childbirth or at very young ages. And of the five, four of the other girls are saints, I believe. Or no, I'm sorry. They were, St. Therese is the only saint. The other, um, at least four of the other five became nuns. That's, that was it. Um, and what really appealed to me personally about Zaley is she just, she was a working mom. She was a lace maker in France, raising this huge gaggle of children. Um, and all of these girls turned out to be such amazing women who wanted to serve the Lord. Um, and if you read some of her writings, she's very um, honest and blunt about how difficult it is to have children running around at all times and how St. Therese in particular was a very difficult child and she has no issue putting that in her letters, um, which I just thought was awesome because I was like, oh, she dealt with toddlers just like I deal with toddlers um, and her writings reflect that. So I just thought it was a really um, great mom to emulate. Yeah, so awesome. Um, yeah, I, I'm just so excited that that existed St. Paul. Cause I know that was one of the things that like, we had a super active parish in Oklahoma when I was like two. So like, I don't remember it, but like, that was so crucial to my mom. And then she moved up here and, and we're not from Howard County. We're from Harford County, but there was just nothing like this void wasteland. Um, yeah. And so it's so great too, when the clergy is willing to connect people and, you know, they have the names in the back of their mind. And um, I think all of our all of our priests and deacons here are very good about like, no, we're going to use your talents. We're going to connect you to who you need to be connected to. They're both, they're all very friendly, you know, um, it's a blessing. So getting into more of the meat and potatoes then, um, what role did faith serve in your upbringing? And Kathleen, if you want to start off with that question. Sure. Well, I'm again, like Erica and you, a transplant. I grew up in New Jersey and I did go to Catholic school all my life, elementary school, high school, college. <clears throat> I came down here for college. I went to Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg. So, um, so the Catholic faith was always just in my life. Um, one of the main things that has always stuck out with me with the Catholic faith is the service piece. I was always involved in some kind of service from elementary, high school, and particularly college. Um, so within my family, you know, we were typically, uh, I have two older brothers, parent, you know, mom and dad, um, but um, we went to church every Sunday. There wasn't a lot of, um, like we didn't say grace at meals or things like that, or the rosary, things that, you know, when I watched the ones with the elementary parents, um, you know, they talked about some of their, their upbringing, upbringings had that in their, um, their life. I mean, the faith was important to my parents, but I think they were just more personal about it than showing us. 
So um, it was something I had found out. Can't remember if it was something my dad told me or I found out after he passed away was um, whenever he passed a Mary statue, he would stop and, you know, say a Hail Mary or, you know, bless himself and move on. But it was something I never really knew he did, but he did. So <laughs> something I, that's, is something that sticks to me. And when we go on our walks now <laughs> in this time, there's a Mary statue that we pass. So always trying to make an effort to point it out. The girls have, um, sort of a devotion to Mary on their own. And so we, um, you know, always try to pause at that Mary too, just to kind of keep that alive. I am muted. Okay. But, what a great connection so, to your grandpa for them. Yeah, and then for me, what's hard about it is they've never met him because he passed away 14 years ago. So for me, it's something to keep alive for them um but yeah as far as i always did service things i participated in bible study like in college and eucharistic ministers I remember going on retreats um and service things the one thing somehow i've always been involved in was one of my favorite things we did in college was bingo with the nuns it was so much fun um we would do that as a as a group, I can't remember which group it was, but <laughs> it was one of our services that the, the college provided with um, one of the facilities in Emmitsburg. So it was fun. So service is one of my things, so. That's so great. And like, I, I love what you're saying, because that's one of the things I've seen kind of reflected each week is like these small things of the faith that we almost don't think about, but like that leave such a big impact, you know? Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right, so Erica, we're gonna switch over to you. Um, if you just wanna talk a little bit about what role Faith served. Sure, so like Kathleen, I was um, raised Catholic from the beginning. I got made all my sacraments. We went to church every Sunday. Um, I am Catholic school educated from pre-K three to PhD is my, my line I like to give. I've never not gone to a Catholic school. Um, which is a really fantastic blessing, I think, um, and not one that everybody's afforded. And I, I really don't take that for granted. Um, we went to church every Sunday. We said grace um, before meals, but that was kind of the extent of what we, what I remember seeing in the home. Um, my mom has a very strong faith life, but I, growing up, I don't remember it ever being very um, visible. It was, it was definitely more personal. Um, and it really wasn't until I was in junior high and I joined our music ministry um, that I started to develop my own personal faith life. Um, and again, kind of like Kathleen, lots of retreats. I was very involved in service um, all the way through high school and college. Um, and I have, have been able to continue that personal relationship um, despite moving away from home and kind of away from my my support network um, and it's been nice it's all of my I'm the oldest of four all of my siblings were raised Catholic I'm the only practicing Catholic now um, of the four of us um, which is not to say that my siblings aren't faithful they just don't they don't practice like we do but it's been a nice bond for my mom and I to continue to have, um, because that's something that we can now relate to on a personal level as adults that you don't necessarily get when you're growing up. Um, so that's been a really fun kind of shift in our dynamic as I've grown up and become a mom um, of young kids. And we've been able to share that, that personal faith relationship in the, on a much deeper level than we ever were when I was growing up. Oh man, this just like, this has been such a cool ministry just to really get to know like different members of the parish. And I hope that's kind of everyone else's feeling when they watch because like Kathleen and I met cause she helped with a uh, VBS last summer. Mm -hmm. Um, but Erica, I, well, we kind of sort of met, but like we really didn't meet until like getting involved in the Facebook group and stuff. So right. it's just been awesome. Um, which is also a plug for if anybody's not on the Facebook group, there's quite a community that's building around that. So thank God for technology. 
Um, all right. <laughs> so transitioning from like, so what you had in your upbringing, it sounds like you both had pretty solid foundation um, to now. So we've talked a little, you know, Kathleen, you mentioned your daughters, with the Mary devotion, Erica, we talked, uh, and Erica, we talked through like Station of the Cross and the coloring. Um, and obviously you're both involved in the parish, but like, what does faith life look like in your home? Kathleen, do you want to start? Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so we're trying to build um, more um, than, let's, than what I grew up with as far as just going to church on Sunday. So we say grace at meals. That was something my husband's family did, so we keep that going. Um, church every Sunday. Um, one of the things that we do is, um, Erica does as well, we go to um, story time and craft at the Our Lady Center. They have that twice a month. And my girls, have, Brenna has done that more than Carrie, um, but uh, they both really like it. Something that Brenna misses right now that she'll ask nice. about. Um, but um, I'm really good at Advent. <laughs> I have a good handle on Advent with the Advent readings. We read, uh, you know, found something online where we read the uh, a Bible passage. Um, and the advent candles and really um, get them involved in the meaning of Christmas um, with the, they have their own little nativity which is the little people nativity they play with that constantly Mary and Joseph go on lots of adventures <laughs> but um, and then we you know talk about some saints um, we have nightly prayers um, and Lent is something um, Erica had given us all a resource and then with everything that happened, <laughs> trying to figure everything out, Lent kind of, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it went out the window, but I didn't, um, I had to focus on other things um, at the time. So Lent is something I want to get better at with them. Um, just with some, I've, I've gotten these cards, but I feel like they're more for older kids and the tasks that they're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. And it's not really like, um, go in and forgive a friend. It seems, you know, like there, this seems like perfect for elementary, but not, you know, like, well, so I'm trying to navigate the Lent for them. Um, but that's pretty much what we do um, yeah. in terms of doing the faith at home and out and about. That's so great. Uh, and that's always something that like, I try to like first, um, there is no perfect parenting and especially with Catholic parenting, like letting yourself have grace. One of my uh, professors always used to say kids are saint makers because they will copy everything you do. So all of a sudden you try to be super like moral about everything. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it's just constantly growing. And I think that's one of the things that's been really cool, especially to see during this time is like people are sharing like that we do grow as a family in faith, you know, and right now, like, just everything's crazy. Like my prayer life's been inconsistent, but like every night I'm trying to do night prayer, you know, Benji has no idea. Benji's six months old. He has no idea what's going on, but it's happening. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much for sharing. So then Erica, if you want to just share some of the things that you've found of what sure. you do. So I think really what it comes down to is just exposure and exposing our kids to different aspects of the faith. Um, you know, we, like you said, there's no perfect way to parent and there's no perfect way to Catholic parent by any stretch. Um, but just exposing our kids to things that are age appropriate um, throughout the liturgical year so that they can kind of understand that there is a liturgical year. So we also do Advent. We have our Advent, um, Advent wreath on the dining room table that we light every night with, at dinner and we do our, our daily reading out of the, um, the little Advent prayer books that they hand out for free at church. Um, we did do for Lent this year, kind of a play on the Jesse tree that they have in Advent, but it was a Jesus tree. And there was a, like a medallion to add to a cross every day um, during Lent with a little Bible story and verse that we, we would read. And it was nice. It's a good visual for the kids to be able to count down to like, okay, well, there's only like five more spots until Easter. And that it told the entire pretty much the entire gospel of Mark from start to finish. 
um, at ending on Easter Sunday, which was really cool. Um, more so for Grace at almost four than, than the babies, but, um, you know, they got to see it every night too. We, some of the little things that we do is we, I make a point of, um, letting them celebrate their namesake St. Days. Um, so for, um, St. Clair in August, we usually have Italian food for dinner. Um, and we make a point of reading the story of St. Clair out of our children's St. book. Um, for St. Catherine Drexel, for, for Kate in March, we had Philly cheesesteaks for dinner um, to, as a nod to her Philadelphia uh, heritage. Um, so little things. It doesn't have to be this big elaborate feast or celebration, but just something for them to acknowledge, like, this is an important day because this saint is looking out for me. Um, we, for baptism days, try to make a point of pulling out their baptismal candles and lighting it and kind of telling them about their baptism day. Um, so it sounds like a lot. I promise it's really not like I don't, I am in no way this example of what liturgical living is like. I just, we're figuring it out as we go along and sometimes it works and sometimes it is a total flop and we know to shift things for our next attempt. Um, but it's just exposing them. They know who the saints are. Grace runs around here every morning and asks me, can I pretend to be Mama Mary today? Sure. You want to go for it. Please do. I would rather you, not that we have anything against princesses, because believe me, we've got a lot of princess costumes in this house too. But if you want to be Mary over Rapunzel for, for an afternoon, I'm perfectly okay with that. Um, so like I said, just exposure. That's, that's really what it has come down to. And not um, not keeping things from them. Like Stations of the Cross can feel really heavy. You don't usually see many babies or toddlers at stations, but they can do it. Like it's going to be extra work. It's difficult. Believe me, it's not fun, especially when stations are at bedtime to take a whiny one and a half year old to, to church, but they can do it. Um, and the more we have found that the more exposure we give to the girls, um, the better they are about participating um, and not just experiencing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's one of the big things that I, especially as I've grown in faith formation, like try to emphasize is like, not just rote ritualism. Like they can know all the prayers. They can know when to sit and when to kneel and stuff. And it's not affecting the heart. It's not a personal relationship with Jesus. Like, yeah, you know, let her be Mary doesn't matter if she does nothing that Mary would have done if she's a little irreverent. Like there, there's something really pure in that, you know, heart. And what you're both saying too, about like having to adapt things almost down, um, which I remember saying when I was uh, looking at different ministries that I could go into professionally because my degree is in theology, that doesn't open a lot of doors other than ministry. Um, and I said like the one ministry I was looking at, I was like, I don't know if I can just break it down to the bare basics. Like, because I was very academic and, you know, I really wanted to, and that's kind of what I'm doing now too. Like it, it's just breaking down the basics. And I remember one of my mentors just saying to me, that's, that's harder. <laughs> like You'll find you're using way more brain power to do that than like giving an hour long dissertation about, you know, some obscure piece of theology, which mm -hmm. has been the truth, but it's so much more fun. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just derive so much joy and I'm sure you both do as well like seeing kids get involved and like seeing young families at mass even if the kid won't sit in their seat you know and um two weeks ago when we had ellie on she talked a little bit about like how she had slowly kind of tricked her kids into behaving at mass um through like various stages of uh i don't even know what to call it but like switching you know various items out so what have you guys found like has worked for you you know, and even if that's like, I know for my family, we were always in the narthex at the back of church. And, you know, if a kid started screaming, they were taken out. But um, Kathleen, if you want to start just like any advice for parents or yeah, any, any horror stories, whatever you want to share about the experience of bringing kids to math. Um, this is one good funny story, but basically we just bring, um, Carrie's never been one to keep herself as well occupied in the pew. Occasionally she is. Brenna's a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. If you give Brenna one of those water wows, she's pretty content. And, um, you know, she's sitting there and even though she might be coloring, she is listening. 
you know, she'll all of a sudden you'll kind of, you know, listen and she's saying, ah, oh, man, you know, and kind of following along in the mass too. But the, the water wells have been um, our kind of go-to in um, that respect. Sometimes bringing um, both of mine um, have loveys that need to go everywhere we go. Um, so bringing those have, you know, have helped. Um, but that's basically what we've done is, is water wells. And, um, so stock up on those <laughs> when they come around, um, and, um, you know, trying to get them engaged in the mass, um, as much as possible. It's, it's definitely been more of a challenge now with watching it at home. Mm -hmm. Um, but we've done a little few things to get them engaged, um, Currently, when um, we're really when the they were doing the Easter blessings with the holy water, we have some holy water from when our house was blessed when we first moved in, from the Father Monsignor Tillman from St. John's, and so Carrie was blessing us with the holy water at the time, and then I've added them ringing the bells. I found Christmas bells. <laughs> they ring the bells at consecration just so that they're somewhat engaged. Um, but otherwise, anything like water wells or books have helped us. So great. Thank you for sharing. All right, Erica. So we also, um, each of the girls has, we call it their church bag. They each have a little backpack um, that comes to church with us. We look like we're bringing our entire house when we walk into mass some days. Um, but it's full of religious books. Um, so they're on very rare occasion do they bring something that's not religious. For the most part, we've really tried to keep anything that comes into church, um, something that's either a book on saints or their missiles. Um, they each have like a little etch-a-sketch or magna doodle, magna doodle, I think, um, that they can color with, but it's very small, um, nothing noisy um, that goes into church because we just don't want it. For us, I sing in the, um, contemporary choir at the 930 mass and so I usually have at least one if not two of the kids up in the choir loft where they have to be quiet um, so trying not to give them anything noisy um, has been important but um, that really we we have done everything we can to try and keep them in in the church um, obviously if somebody's having a meltdown we take them out of you know yeah. out into the narthex or on rare occasion down into the nursery, but we really have tried to keep them in the pews as much as, as possible. Um, and some days that works better than others. And some days they listen well. My, my horror story was, gosh, earlier, when did I ask you about jam? Grace started going to jam in February, right before quarantine. So it must've been beginning of February, end of January. We were in mass and Grace was standing, looking over the edge of the, uh, reeling in the choir loft and had her book up there. And I told multiple people told her, you need to step back and be careful. And sure enough, the second I walked away from telling her she needed to be careful, her book went down over the reeling into the pews. Um, so not, not ideal to make that amount of noise right at the end of mass, but kids are kids. And we got lucky that she didn't hit anybody this time. Um, but you know, really the more I have found, the more I engage her, whether that's helping her look through her books during her homily or whoever I'm holding at the time, picking them up and at consecration, making the point of saying, look, there's Jesus. Do you see Father Tyler up there? He's holding Jesus up. You know, do you want to say hi? And really just kind of getting them um, to recognize the different parts of the mass. Um, it's definitely been harder during quarantine for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we have tried really hard to despite the fact that we sit on our couch in the living room, which I'm staring at the playroom right now um, on the other side of the room and all of their toys are right there. For the most part, they've been pretty good about coming and sitting on the couch with us. Um, we've made our coffee table into a little at home altar. So we cover it with a bed, white bed sheet and we put our crucifix and our um, candle on there. And we have tried really hard to make the space reverent as much as possible. Um, some days that works better than others, but they seem to recognize if we say, okay, church is, you know, church is starting, we're going to sit and watch church. 
that they need to at least come and sit. They get their church books, they get their snacks, and we sit on the couch just like we would if we were at church in a pew. Awesome. No, and I agree with you, like, engaging them as much as possible. Um, I've always heard, not I've always heard, but I've heard, like, sit in the front if you can, which works for some families, doesn't for others, you know. And I, I think, Erica, you said something really important, too, like, kids are kids, you know, like, um, I've heard a couple of families say, like, my kids don't behave well enough to ever take them into mass, and maybe when they're six or seven, and, like, they can still get something out of it. I mean, like, they have been baptized, the Holy Spirit moves in them, um, and, and they can, like, there's grace that comes, and there's extra grace for parents, you know, like, mm-hmm. pathway to sainthood right there, trying to <laughs> pay attention during all that, but, yeah, there are also those beautiful moments of, like, I remember, like, particularly when my siblings were smaller, like, you know, showing them how to fold their hands and kneel at the consecration. And um, there's the Amina Christi prayer, which a lot of people, it, it's a practice to pray it after you receive communion, soul of Christ, sanctify me, body of Christ. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, water from the side of Christ, wash me. I'm trying to remember what the other ones are, but my mom would like teach it to us in little stages. And so depending on the age of the kid, like they would only say the first line or the second line or going forward. Um, and I think being able to walk through stuff like that is very helpful as well. Um, and realizing, like, again, there's stages. We're going all throughout life. Like, yeah. I think, it, I think it's hard, too, because I think there's this misconception, especially among new young parents, that, like, if my kid's loud, that's disruptive. And I can't take my kid into church if they're going to potentially be disruptive because people are going to be upset. And I have definitely had those moments where you have a kid who's fussing and you're just like, Ugh this is embarrassing, but at least at St. Paul's, it has been so humbling and welcoming. And we, I can't tell you how many times a parent or an older couple or an older woman has stopped us on the way in or out of church and said, we just love having your kids here. Please don't stop bringing them to mass. They were so good. And I'm like, are you kidding? They were running up and down the pew for the last hour. They were not good. And she's like, no, they were great. They were not disruptive at all. Just please keep bringing them. Um, and that's just so reassuring as a young a parent or a parent of not necessarily a young parent, but a parent of young kids yeah. um, to know that like they're welcome there. And I think it's becoming more clear that our kids are the future of the church. And if we hope to have a Catholic church in another 20, 30 years, as the baby boomers move on, um, that we have to be encouraging our young kids now Mm -hmm. um, to maintain their faith because of so much at least of my I feel like of my generation has either left um, or chosen to not continue practicing for a multitude of reasons but I really think that if we're not encouraging our kids now that we're not going to have a Catholic church and really, our priests, too, are very encouraging. Father Ray is, you know, at the, at the, the 930 Mass, because there is jam and then the great gospel once a month um, for the older kids. You know, he's very much like, I love hearing all the kids. Don't, you know, don't worry about it. He's very much affirming. Um, Father Tyler's been that way um, for one of the... Um, for one of the jam sessions that I did, um, it was the um, the Three Kings Day, and we had made crowns, and the kids all came up with crowns, and Monsignor John, he was, you know, he just said, I loved all the royalty that came up, you know, so, like, it was just, it was reaffirming that we did something, and the kids really liked it, they were engaged in the activity, and then they came up, and then the rest of the parish was engaged with them, sitting there with their crowns. Um, so it, it is definitely a help when the priests also encourage the families um, of young children to come too. Amen. Uh, so we're going to start wrapping up because we're getting to the, we're at the 45 minute mark. Um, one of the questions I'd ask you guys is like, what is a time in your life when you had to trust God? And particularly like in this lens, not share whatever is on your heart. But like, I think this is so important to share the stories of like faith and when our faith may have been tested or where we've really seen how God loves us because 
so many people are struggling right now. And I've heard just an overwhelming amount of people this week say like, I, I don't know what I believe anymore. Um, so really thank you truly for your testimonies for being willing to say like, my family's still in this, you know, it might not be perfect. It might not be pretty, but like we're here. So, um, Erica, if you want to just quickly, uh, just talk about a time of trust. Sure. Um, so I was thinking about this last night after I'd nursed the baby and I was waiting for her to kind of fall back to sleep. And really the last year for me has been, um, trying. We, um, we pretty strictly practice natural family planning and Kate, who's now six months was a not an oops, but uh, that didn't work quite how we were expecting to surprise. And um, I really struggled with that. Um, I am, I like to be in control and I like to have a plan. And I we had literally just decided we were going to avoid for a few more months um, so that I could figure out if I was going to go back to work full time this past fall. And I put all of my nursing clothes and maternity clothes away. I just weaned Claire and a week and a half later, I found out I was pregnant. Um, so God's plans are always bigger than ours, um, but I had a really hard time accepting that. Um, I was like 35 weeks before I was like, oh, this is actually happening. I'm going to have a baby. Um, so the, it takes a lot of faith to kind of give up that control. And I did not do that um, well last year at all. Um, and that was really hard for me. I, you know, I hate to admit that I was angry with the Lord. Um, but I was angry that I had had a plan and he did not like my plan enough. And he was going to add to our family before I was ready. Um, cause I knew that having three kids in three and a half years was not going to be an easy task. Um, and it certainly hasn't been, especially through quarantine. Um, there are definitely some challenges there, um, but it has, it really tested my faith um, in a way that I hadn't been, been tested before. Um, quarantine has continued that for sure. We've had a lot of loss in our family in the last two and a half months um, and a lot of challenges, and that has made it difficult to find the um, positives in all of this, but something for me, at least that I have been trying to remember, um, especially in the first few days of quarantine, as I just felt like I can't catch my breath from anything. Like it just was this constant wave of like feeling like you're out in the ocean and you're getting caught in the waves and you can't come up for air fast enough before you get hit with another wave. And it took about three days of me feeling like that before I had stopped and went, he's in the boat too. Like, mm -hmm. You have to think back think when the apostle's boat was being trashed by the waves he was in the boat and at some point he's going to wake up and say we're calming the storm now and that has really been what has helped me um for the last few months every time i feel like okay this is getting too overwhelming and there's some i can't do this any longer to just stop myself and say he's in the boat erica you're gonna be okay and that gives you that for me gives me a little bit of peace um not to say that there aren't hard days for sure um, or that, that I remember that all the time. And sometimes I go two or three days angry before I remember that he's still there. Um, but it's, uh, you know, quarantine for all of its bad has had a lot of positives and that it's forced us as parents to be um, more deliberate in how we're practicing the faith at home um, because we can't just say, oh, well, we're going to go to church on Sunday and that's, that's it for the week. And, um, our kids are watching every single move and they're aching, especially Grace aching for, for pieces of the faith. So, um, you know, I am trying my best to remain positive. Um, and it's getting easier as we're slowly coming out of the self-isolation piece of it. But yeah, um, trust any, any time that you have to trust, I, <laughs> that's, that's a tough one, tough one for me. Yeah. And yeah, and we are just, we're being called out on the water, you know, <laughs> like, it's a real thing. All right, Kathleen? Um, I think it's, for me, it's the, the trust ebbs and flows. Um, 
couple of examples that I can think of is um, my dad passing away suddenly um, 14 years ago. Um, I remember asking, waking up the morning, I, I found out that he passed away was, um, okay, God, what's next? I literally asked that out loud. And a couple weeks later, I met my husband. So it was, you know, trusting he's listening, but sometimes you're not always listening. Um, we struggled to get pregnant. Um, and that's another struggle that I've had um, in terms of I was 38 when I had Carrie, so older, 40 when I had Brenna. And that's been a struggle being an older mom and trying to like, okay, why did you do, why did you wait so long for us to have kids, you know? Um, and, um, but just that trust, uh, this year has been another year where I've really, really started to let go of things, um, in terms of just liking staying at being the staying at home, be, being the stay at home mom, that's been a struggle, um, in that choice. Um, but, uh, just having that trust um, has increased. I did go on the ACT retreat, and that's another area where I learned about trust from all the other women that were on the retreat and um, just their experiences and their motherhood has helped. So, um, but yeah, it's definitely an ebb and flow, but it, it's, it is taking that moment, like Erica is saying, to stop and listen, or just to remind yourself that he's in the boat and that he is listening. And um, it takes time, but it is a journey. The whole faith is a journey, the motherhood is a journey, but it, it, it can go nicely together. Yeah, oh my gosh. Again, thank you both for sharing so much, because that both of, you know, you're saying, my family is not quite how I thought it would look, or, you know, if I had been able to plan it, and um, Erica, as you were talking, I was thinking about that because I remember I got into a fight, let's call it with a blessed virgin one time because I prayed this big, long novena for this intention. And then at the end of it, nothing had changed. <laughs> and at the time it was that I was hoping that my college boyfriend would come back around and we would end up engaged and married and stuff. Now I'm happy that didn't happen. But like <laughs> at the time it was not. <laughs> um, yeah, so many great things. I, I just too saw my mom go through that last year with her dad died very suddenly. Like he had a stroke the day before my wedding and my oh grandma gave me my nature and of honor. And like, it was just, but within that, like my husband and I then, um, at the beginning of our honeymoon, went to the hospital and visited my grandpa and at the end, like in our wedding clothes. And then at the end of the honeymoon, like went back and like, it was a really good reminder for us of like, this is what marriage is, you know, like it is the sickness, the health, the suffering, the love, the joy, you know, and that that's the faith, you know, um, Erica, I know we'd already talked about this, but like, we are having a session on NFP because Can't wait. it's such a taboo topic and it's so yes. frustrating. And I know I shared with you, like, I was so frustrated with postpartum stuff because I was like, I didn't realize it would change and get difficult. <laughs> and um, yeah, one of my other friends had like three kids within four years. And so I reached out to her and I was like, if you want, like we can share resources. And she was like, yes. <laughs> so I'm so excited, um, to get to be, talk. Be about careful it. if you're nursing, be careful when you start weaning. Cause okay. that's how we have Kate. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I was, well, we love dearly, but <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we went through with an instructor actually recently, like to really start charting stuff. and um. And I did not think I would have to do that this early, but, mm -hmm. and it was a real struggle for us too, just to be honest, like to make that decision that we were going to stick with that practice, you know? And again, I feel like nobody talks about it, but we're going to, because why I'm not? Yeah. The kids are in bed. It's fine. Oh my Absolutely. God. Thank you both so much for sharing, um, for the beautiful witnesses of your families for, yeah, just rocking along in this time for trusting the Lord for uh, sharing your witnesses with us. We'll end in prayer. Um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for these women and their families and their witnesses. Um, thank you for our community of resurrection in St. Paul and for a church that truly supports the family. Help us to continue to nourish the families that you put in our path to help them grow in the faith 
and to grow closer to you with every day. Jesus Christ, in your name we pray. Amen. Father, yes. Son, Holy Spirit. Something else I forgot. It's come up every single week is a plug for the Axe Retreat. So I don't know if that means something. But... Well, I plugged it for you because I said I went. So. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Every single week I, it's come up. So. It, it, well, yeah, I went and I was on team for the, didn't make it to the March retreat for various reasons, but I was on the team. <laughs> it counts. No, I mean, yeah. that's, that's obviously such a ministry that like really nourishes our community, you know? And really, it, I, I'm sure Ellie probably mentioned it, but getting the younger moms out there to that retreat, it really is, it's an amazing, it's an amazing experience and we need more of the younger moms to experience it too. Or any mom, everybody to experience it, but the younger moms, it's a big commitment, but it is worth it. Well, I was a little too close to my due date for the October one to be feasible. Right. <laughs> you know what? I think so was I. Like, I was still like two months out, but I was like, I'm wobbling everywhere. It's not right. going <laughs> to uh, I'm pretty sure Kate came a week later, so did, yeah. it was a little too close for me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but no, that is something that Ellie and I, I don't think we talked about on camera, we talked about it off camera, like, there's kind of this stigma that like, oh, it's all the older ladies that do acts, and that's not necessarily true, you know, there is, there is such a space, and there's such a welcoming community there. Um, I'm excited to one day experience it, because I am one of those ones that hasn't been able to go yet. The one week it was like, I had an event Thursday night, Saturday morning, and Sunday, and I was like, there's no way it's happening. Yeah. Um, and I mean, like, at the church, because they were like, we can't, you can come. And I was like, no, I can't. <laughs> um, all right, ladies, thank you so much. Um, and then we will have, we are off next week for anyone that's watching. Um, we are going to have a general open forum where parents can just come on, connect, meet, uh, talk to, I don't know if Kate, Susan or I will be on, but you know, one or two or three of us will be on. Um, I, Erica did it last time. It's when we got to connect over the fact that her baby was not asleep. Um, <laughs> mine, I was muted a lot of this because mine is not asleep. So, <laughs> uh, 